Hi everyone, my name is Elise Foligno and I'm the Ultrasound Fellow for the 2022 to 2023 academic year. Today we're going to be talking about the RUSH exam, which is the Rapid Ultrasound for Shock and Hypotension. This is an ultrasound exam designed to be used in a patient with undifferentiated shock or hypotension. This exam is ideal for differentiating between the different types of shock in a hypotensive patient and with practice can be done in two to three minutes. In studies looking at the ability of this exam to identify a type of shock in an otherwise undifferentiated patient, the RUSH exam has been estimated to have a sensitivity of up to 87% in identifying a source of shock. You can imagine that it would be pretty helpful to be able to identify the diagnosis or at least identify the type of shock in the first three minutes of taking care of a critically ill patient. Identifying the type of shock can help guide your choice in different medications, other therapies, and in obtaining further imaging. Here are some things on the differential for undifferentiated hypotension or shock that you may be able to diagnose immediately with a bedside rush exam. We'll go through some examples of scans showing each of these pathologies during this talk. So how are we going to do a rush exam? Traditional teaching of the rush exam includes using the curvilinear or abdominal probe shown on the right side of the screen for all of the views in the rush exam, including the cardiac views. However, I recognize that you've practiced obtaining cardiac views with the cardiac or phased array probe shown on the left of the screen, and have practiced assessing for pneumothorax with the linear probe shown in the middle. If you choose, you can switch between probes for each part of this exam, recognizing that the exam will take a bit longer as you switch between probes. If you need a refresher on which probes are best for which indication, please refer to the probes and knobs lecture on the Cooper Ultrasound YouTube channel. Next, we'll talk about the different views that we're going to include in the RUSH exam. There's an acronym for the views that is commonly used when talking about the RUSH exam. The acronym is HIMAP. The picture here on the slides shows each of the views in the exam. H stands for heart to remind you of the parasternal long and short axis views and the apical four chamber view. I stands for IVC. M stands for Morrison's to remind you of the abdominal views, the right upper quadrant, left upper quadrant, and suprapubic views. A stands for aorta, and P stands for pulmonary. Next, we'll talk through each of the views that we're going to obtain in our RUSH exam, with an emphasis on pathology in each view that may cause shock or hypotension. My explanation in the next few slides on how to generate each image and the normal anatomy seen in each scan is going to be relatively brief. If you find yourself needing more of a refresher on this information, please refer to the corresponding videos in the Cooper Ultrasound YouTube channel. Here is a still image of the parasternal long axis view of the heart. You can see here the left atrium, the mitral valve, the left ventricle, the aortic outflow tract with the aortic valve here, the right ventricle shown here, and back here we have the descending aorta. Let's take a look at this parasternal long axis view of the heart. This clip shows a normal heart, and on this slide, I'd like to pay particular attention to the ejection fraction of the heart, keeping in mind that normal is about 55% or higher. In assessing for ejection fraction, we're looking mostly at the LV, which is shown here. And we can appreciate in this clip that the walls of the LV are contracting concentrically together, and that they're coming quite close to an imaginary line that we might draw right here through the LV. This represents a normal ejection fraction. Let's compare that to this view of the heart. Again, let's pay particular attention to the LV over here. Hopefully you can appreciate that the walls of this LV are barely contracting at all, consistent with a reduced ejection fraction. Next, let's take a look at this parasternal long axis view of the heart. This is the same normal clip as on the last slide, but this time I'd like to pay particular attention to the pericardium. We can see in this view that the descending aorta is just below the heart, down here in the clip, and we can see this bright white line just above it, along here, which represents the pericardium. We can appreciate in this view that there is no fluid collection, which would appear as an anechoic or black area on the screen anterior to the descending aorta between the pericardium and the chambers of the heart. Compare that to this view here. Here again, we can see the descending aorta here, but this time, we can see this area of fluid, which appears anechoic or black, anterior to the descending aorta between the pericardium and the chambers of the heart, which is indicative of the presence of a pericardial effusion.
Let's take one last look at this normal parasternal long axis view of the heart, this time focusing up here on the right ventricle. When thinking about the right ventricle in this view of the heart, we look for a one to one to one ratio between the right ventricle here, the aortic outflow tract shown here, and the left atrium shown here. Here we can see that ratio preserved in that all of those three structures appear to be about the same size. Compare that to this view of the heart, where we can see that the right ventricle, shown here, clearly seems to be larger than the aortic outflow tract and the left atrium. This is consistent with the presence of a dilated right ventricle. I'd like to make an important note here. The parasternal long axis view of the heart is not the best view for commenting on equality between the RV and the LV. If the one to one to one ratio of the right ventricle, aortic outflow tract, and left atrium is preserved in this view, that does not necessarily mean that the right side of the heart is normal. You need more views of the heart to say that with confidence. However, if you can see a clear abnormality in this ratio in the parasternal long view, as we can see in this clip shown on the right of the screen, it is appropriate to comment on the deviation from the normal one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one ratio and comment that there is likely dilation of the right ventricle. We're going to skip over the parasternal short axis views of the heart in this video for the sake of time and in the interest of avoiding redundancy. Let's next take a look through the apical four views of the heart. Here's a still image of an apical four view of the heart. In this view, we can see all four chambers of the heart. Here's the left ventricle, the left atrium with the mitral valve in between. Here's the right ventricle, the right atrium with the tricuspid valve in between. In an ideal view, we can see both the left and the right ventricular free walls, as well as both the mitral and tricuspid valves. Here's a look at a normal apical four-chamber view. Let's pay attention on this slide to the normal ejection fraction, shown here by looking at the left ventricle. You can appreciate here that the walls of the left ventricle are contracting concentrically, and that if we estimated the ejection fraction based on this clip, it would likely be normal. Compare that to this clip here, where you can appreciate that the walls of the left ventricle, shown here, are barely contracting at all, consistent with a reduced ejection fraction. On this slide, let's take another look at this normal clip, this time paying attention to the pericardium surrounding the heart, this bright white line right here. We can see here that there is no anechoic fluid collection surrounding the heart. Let's compare that clip to this one where we can clearly see a fluid collection shown here as this anechoic area between the pericardium of the heart and the chambers of the heart, indicating the presence of a pericardial effusion. Finally, let's take one last look at this normal apical four-chamber view, this time paying attention to the ratio between the size of the right ventricle and the size of the left ventricle, as measured just here, above the tricuspid valve and above the mitral valve, respectively. In this view, we can see that the normal ratio of right ventricle to left ventricle is preserved, with the right ventricle not larger than the left. Compare that clip to this one, where we can clearly see that the right ventricle, as measured across here, is much larger than the left ventricle, as measured across here. This clip shows a dilated right ventricle, which is suggestive of right heart strain. That covers our cardiac views for the rush exam. Let's move on to talking about the IVC, the I in HIMAP. We're going to talk in this lecture about using the IVC only as a sign of cardiac tamponade in the presence of a pericardial effusion. Some practitioners will also use IVC ultrasound to assess for volume status. However, this practice gets complex very quickly with multiple factors playing into a patient's volume status and the IVC's appearance on ultrasound. However, IVC scans are quite reliable in assessing for tamponade in a patient with a pericardial effusion. Here's a still image of the scan we're going to be obtaining. You can see the IVC here, which is identified because it's feeding into the right atrium, seen here. The other way we can identify the IVC on ultrasound is by seeing the hepatic veins feed into it, which is not seen in this still. Here's a normal clip of an IVC. We can see the vessel here feeding into the right atrium here. And you can appreciate that there is some variation in the size of the IVC here as the patient breathes. Compare that scan to this one. This clip has the orientation flipped, so the right atrium is on screen right over here. We can still see the IVC here feeding into the right atrium, 
However, you can see that this IVC is quite dilated and full, and it really has no variation here as the patient breathes. You can also see in this image a per pericardial effusion seen here. The findings of a dilated IVC with no respiratory variation in the context of a patient with a pericardial effusion is highly suggestive of cardiac tamponade. The next set of scans in the rush exam are the abdominal views, which are noted in the HIMAP acronym by M for Morrison's, referencing Morrison's pouch in the right upper quadrant view. Let's start by talking about the, the right upper quadrant view. Here's a still image of the liver and the kidney, with the liver shown here and the kidney shown here. And here is the interface between the liver and the kidney, which is the space known as Morrison's pouch. In an ideal view of the right upper quadrant, we'd also see the diaphragm here as a bright white line, and we'd be able to see the thorax above it further up this way. Ideally, we'd also be able to see completely the caudal tip of the liver just down here, as this is another area that fluid can accumulate in the right upper quadrant. Let's take a look at this normal right upper quadrant scan. We can see here the space between the liver and the kidney, shown here, and we can recognize that there is no anechoic fluid collecting there. We can also just about see the caudal tip of the liver here, although we're missing it a bit at the beginning of the clip, and we can see that there's likely no anechoic fluid collecting there. We're also just catching the diaphragm a bit here as this bright white line on this end of the liver, and ideally we'd see a bit more of the diaphragm as well as the thorax. Let's compare that to this clip, which shows free fluid collecting around the caudal tip of the liver. Here, you can see the anechoic fluid collecting just here. This is indicative of peritoneal free fluid. We can also see in this image that there's an anechoic fluid collection here, above the diaphragm, which is in the thorax, which is indicative of pleural fluid. So this clip shows both peritoneal fluid in the collection here at the caudal tip of the liver, and pleural fluid with the fluid collection here above the diaphragm. The next abdominal view is a left upper quadrant view. Here's a still image of a normal left upper quadrant view showing the spleen here, the kidney here, the diaphragm here as this bright white line, and the thorax up here above the diaphragm. Here's a clip of a normal left upper quadrant view, which shows both the space between the spleen and the kidney here, as well as the space above the spleen between the spleen and the diaphragm here. We can appreciate that in both of these spaces, there's no anechoic fluid collection. It's particularly important to show the space between the spleen and the diaphragm in the left upper quadrant because fluid preferentially collects in this space in the left upper quadrant. Compare that view to this study. Here again, we see the spleen here, the kidney here, the diaphragm here, but in this study, we can see this anechoic area here around the spleen and above the spleen between the spleen and the diaphragm, which is indicative of peritoneal free fluid. Now let's talk about the suprapubic view, where we assess the bladder and for pelvic free fluid. This is a still image of the longitudinal view of the bladder. And here's a normal clip of the longitudinal view of the bladder with no anechoic fluid collection here or here. Here's a still image of the transverse view of the bladder. And here's a normal clip of the bladder in transverse view, again with no anechoic fluid here or here around the bladder. Now let's take a look at this clip, which again is the bladder in transverse view shown here. You can see that it has the same square shape and that the fluid here, the urine inside the bladder, is well bounded. However, you can now see that there's anechoic fluid on both sides of the bladder here and here, and we can see some loops of bowel floating in that fluid. This is indicative of peritoneal free fluid. This concludes the abdominal views included in the M and HIMAP. Next we'll talk about scanning the aorta. Here's a still image of a normal scan of the aorta. We can see the aorta here and the IVC here, and here is the spine, which is a helpful landmark when looking to identify these two vessels. When completing a scan of the aorta, you'll want to scan through the entire length of it, from just below the xiphoid process all the way through the iliac bifurcation. Here's a normal clip of the aorta in transverse view, 
On this slide, I'd like for us to focus on the lumen of the aorta. We can see that it's completely anechoic with nothing inside of it. Just for reference, here's the spine again, and here's the IVC. Let's compare that to this scan of the aorta. Again, here's the spine, here's the aorta, and over here to the left is the IVC. However, in this scan, we can see that within the lumen of the aorta, there's a hyperechoic linear structure, which is consistent with a dissection flap in an abdominal aortic dissection. Let's look again at this normal view of the aorta, this time focusing on the diameter of the aorta. The normal diameter of an aorta is below three centimeters. We're looking here at this measurement here. I recognize that there's no measurements recorded on this clip. However, over here, we can see that there's centimeter markers. Here's one centimeter, two, three, four, and five. Hopefully using this scale, you can appreciate that the diameter of this aorta here is far less than three centimeters, and so is, is within the normal range. Let's compare that to this scan. Here, we can see that the diameter of this aorta, if we look in comparison to this scale, here's the five centimeter marker, is really approaching six centimeters. This scan is consistent with an abdominal aortic aneurysm. This is a still image of the aorta in longitudinal view. We generate this view just by turning the probe 90 degrees so you can see the entire length of the vessel through the abdomen. Here's a normal clip of the aorta in longitudinal view. In this view, we can see that the lumen of the vessel is anechoic throughout. Let's compare that to this view. Here, we can see this hyperechoic linear structure within the lumen of the aorta which is consistent with a dissection flap, as would be seen in an abdominal aortic dissection. Here again is the same normal clip of the aorta, showing a normal diameter here. I'd also like you to notice that the caliber of the aorta stays consistent throughout the length of it. Let's compare that to this study, where we can see this wide dilatation in the caliber of the aorta, which is consistent with an abdominal aortic aneurysm. The final scan in the HIMAP sequence is a pulmonary scan for pneumothorax. Here is a still of the image that we're going to be obtaining. This shows the pleural line here between a rib here and a rib here, just deep to the superficial structures of the chest wall. This clip here shows normal lung sliding. You can see the pleural line just here between two ribs, one and two, and you can clearly see that the pleural line is sliding back and forth. This clip shows normal lung sliding, which is indicative of no pneumothorax. Let's compare that to this clip. Again, we see the pleural line here between a rib here and a rib here. Except in this clip, I hope you can appreciate that the pleural line here is not moving at all. This clip is consistent with no lung sliding, which suggests that there could be a pneumothorax present. This sums up our discussion of the rush exam the rapid ultrasound for shock and hypotension. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me or Dr. Sodi at our email addresses listed here. Thank you.